I'm Becky Stanton. I'm a staff toxicologist with OSPR. Um, I guess more of the details of bio. We, I do this as a tag team with Regina Donahoe and Bruce Job. They're some of the other toxicologists that work my group. Um, so we help put this together and um, rotate through. Um, I'm, some of what I'm going to cover has been covered before. I'll try to speed through that. Some of it will be introduction for talks you'll get later in the week. So I'll probably kind of broach that with you. And certainly if you have any questions going along, um, another acronym, Rich Field. So um, make sure to point out if I'm missing something, but I'll try to make sure I explain all those. So um, without further ado, I'm here to talk about some of the, the ecotoxicology that's been broached. Jordan did a good job of introducing some of those topics. So go in a little more detail. Um, so, the, so this is oh, for you. Oh, oh you have it up there. Um, that's good, I don't have to open it. Um, kind of give an overview of ecotoxicology um, and what that is and how it fits into this field, um, particularly in the focus of petroleum spills. Um, so ecotoxicology, toxicology in general, is looking at the adverse effects on chemicals. Um, you know, pharmacology is the benefits of, of chemicals. This is the flip side. And you're looking at the difference between what you're exposed to and what the effects are, are as a result. And then ecotoxicology is focusing not on humans, but the other aspects of the organism, uh, the different species in their communities and the environment. Um, so when you look at a concentration in the water, in the sediment, so kind of what we consider external outside the organisms, and as we absorb that, that gets into the organism and is either excreted through um, urine or bile or feces, and some of it's absorbed into the tissues, and that's often where you see an effect. And so we look at, again, that exposure either through an external media concentration or what's actually in the tissues, and then make the inference about what the effects are. And so when we look at exposure, again, as Jordan mentioned, we can talk about an acute, an hour, or day exposure to a chemical or more chronic days, months, years, and how that influences what the effects are and, and what the accumulation is in the organism. And so one of the, the kind of standard things we look at is that, again, the relationship between the exposure to a chemical and, you know, as an example, we're looking at a concentration on the x-axis. In this case, it's a water concentration, so it's in milligrams per liter. And then we look at an endpoint on the y-axis. In this case, it's pretend mortality of a population that's being exposed. And sort of a typical um, measurement of that is, is the LC50, the lethal concentration to 50% of the population. And so basically, you're looking on a, on a curve that tends to increase. Um, and what you hope to see in your data is a dose response curve. And so we looked at basically where's 50%, draw it across the curve, and then what's that concentration? Um, so for any one chemical and any one input, you will have that type of curve. And then if they have a different chemical, you can look at that comparison between the two LC50s, and if it's a lower concentration, it's more toxic for that input. So basically, if you're shifting the, the concentration at which you see 50% mortality, it's, it's showing the difference between chemicals. And so we can look at that, like for example, for, t for different components of, of a crude oil. Um, as an example for this with fish, is looking at a reproductive endpoint um, where it was the number of eggs per female, again, your input on the y-axis, and then the concentrations of water on the x-axis. And um, you could see where you see a shift from basically like a control population where you don't have an effect to where you start seeing a change in the distribution. And so LOEC is lowest observed adverse effect concentration, and then the next dose below that is your no observed adverse effect concentration. So that's going to be dependent on what dosage you're using in your study. So, um, and then we use those as benchmarks to compare what we have concentrations we measure in the field. So it's again an example of how we would use this exposure effects relationship to help understand what might be happening in the field with a given species and a given concentration of a chemical. Um, when we look at effects, we can look at the direct effects on an individual. Um, is one of those fish exposed to a given chemical, and what are the effects on, on that particular individual or that group of individuals? But we can also look at the indirect effects, because we're looking at an ecosystem as a whole. We know there's interrelationships between different species. Um, 
example on, on the right is from the Exxon Valdez spill where they saw a decrease in the fucus, the, the rock weed on the rocks, and then they saw a decrease in the grazers that feed on that. And because the grazers went down, they actually saw an increase in algae. Um, so green algae, a different algae. Um, so you can see that change of, it was only affecting directly one aspect of the ecosystem, but you see changes overall as a result. And their aspect is, um, you know, if you have affect a, a primary producer and you have less diet, food in your diet, so therefore you can see a decrease in growth, for example. Um, so there are lots of different ways to look at petroleum toxicity. Again, as a couple of people have mentioned, it's really a complex mixture. And so we need to look at it in different ways depending on what we have available. So petroleum product mixture. What's your crude oil as a whole? What's your diesel mixture? And just basically measuring it as a total petroleum hydrocarbon or TPH measure. So pretty general, but there's certain benchmarks that are based on that and just gives you an overall cut of what you have in the system. Um, indicator compounds. Um, BTEX, again, the benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene. <laughs> your volatile organic compounds that you often look at as a mixture. Um, or benzoapyrene, um, BAP, is another indicator compound that we have done a fair amount of toxicology on, so we have some benchmarks, and those kind of give you a sense of what might be happening with the mixture as a whole. Um, we can have individual fractions, again, as um, Jim mentions, um, the aliphatics, the monoaromatics, the polyaromatics, or polynuclear aromatics, um, like the high molecular weight, um, polycyclic or polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons. Again, this is an example of a, a three-ring compound. And then you also have the polar molecules, which are more soluble. And then the asphaltines are the really sticky high molecular weight compounds. And partly, as, as it was showing with the weathering, that changes how um, these aspects are in the environment, but also how the organisms um, handle these products. So I want to start out with how these affect fish, invertebrates, and aquatic plants. Um, so we can have acute effects, again, when there's exposure over a short time period, hours or days. Things die. Um, basic mortality is um, something we like to see. It's, um, in terms of being able to assess injury, we can count dead bodies, and um, it's hard to dispute that. Um, you can also see it at a more micro level. It basically dissolves cell membranes or breaks into cell membranes, and so things leak out of them, and we can measure how that impacts them. Um, you also have basically, um, we call it non-polar narcosis. It's the same effect you have with um, anesthesia. You basically um, impact the behavior and function of those organisms as these products um, enter. Um, basically, we also have just the direct physical contact of, of that chemical, particularly some of the heavier chemicals um, um, coating the organism. Um, this is an example from the Costco Busan spill. It's probably a fine print for those in the back. Um, they look at this is a rocky and tidal um, area, Rodeo Beach, and they were looking at a particular area of, of the oiled um, um, rocky and tidal algae comparing to where they had unoiled. You can look close up and actually see the, the oiled algae on the rock, and they actually do transects and make sure they get the same area. And then they come back a couple months later, and you actually see the bleaching of the algae, where you previously had oil smothering. Um, when we look at more chronic effects on plant growth, basically measure, um, in this example, they were looking at plant height and looking at changes with different concentrations of oil and seeing, again, what you hope to see, a, a dose response curve that gives you this relationship. And so at a certain point, you see a, a decrease in growth with an increasing amount of oil and sediment. Um, one of the other things we see when we look at different mixtures of petroleum is chronic effects. Again, with that narcosis impact, you can look at changes in feeding behavior, um, uh, burying, so it makes them less ac accessible to predators. And that can really affect the survivorship of these organisms. Um, one of the other components, again, is, is the chronic effects of different constituents of the oil and how we look at that. Um, again, pH is polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons is one that we look at a lot. They're residual in, this, in the system. Um, they have a more long-term effect. Um, and so they've been known to do um, a lot of different types of effects and been a fair amount of studies on these. 
Um, some of the particular ones I'll go through are, are the early life stages of fish, um, seeing cancer with these exposures, um, and then some other sublethal effects. And I don't think I mentioned this, but when you look at acute effects, it's often relative to the life stage. Um, if you have a, a egg or larval stage of a fish, that whole period is fairly short. So what might be a, a several hour exposure is actually a, a broader component of, of that um, particular life stage. So we actually see that as a, as a more um, a chronic aspect of that exposure. <laughs> um, then we dealt with the polar compounds. Again, these are kind of increasing study on how these affect organisms. Um, so a little more detail on their, their early life stages. There's been a lot of work um, in the NOAA lab up in Washington. I don't know if that's Seattle. Um, They've done a fair amount of this work. Some of the other ones have come out from recent spills as well. Um, so basically, again, this is looking at a, a total pH concentration of water, um, part per billion, so microgram per liter concentration is fairly low, um, and looking at impacts to um, early life stage just in terms of larvae. And I think this was a, a pretty short exposure time for that. Um, so just seeing how, with this exposure, you have increased amount of, of larvae that are dying <coughs> as a result. Um, when you look into why they're dying, you can actually see abnormal embryos as a result. Um, this is a particular pH compound, phenanthrene, um, with a um, particular water exposure concentration. And then when they basically do the, the carrier, the solvent that you have to put it, the chemical in into solution, you see that they have normal embryos, um, whereas you have these abnormalities with the, this particular pH, where you see the spinal deformity, um, cardiac edema, um, fluid around the heart, and, and that type of thing, and all the embryos that look like this die. Um, as far as a specific si spill example, this is Casca Busan. They looked at herring that spawned in areas within the spill zone and outside the spill zone after the spill had occurred and basically saw similar patterns where the, the spawn larvae outside the spill zone you know, were normal representative and had high survival rates, whereas those within the spill zone, um, most of them died or were lost and also had these specific abnormalities. Um, one of the other inputs in, in terms of, in addition to survivorship, um, was done with a study on English soil where they looked at, in, in this case, it was a sediment exposure um, to, again, total PAHs um, in sediment. And they're looking at, in this case, four different endpoints. Um, so again, we'd be looking at a, a certain proportion that are affected, where do you see this change in, in effect? So um, for at basically over 600 part per billion um, difference, we see changes in inf number of infertile eggs, and in this case, it would be the inhibited spawning. So again, two endpoints that are showing up as fairly sensitive to exposure, um, in this case, through pHs and sediment. Um, one of the em other endpoints that we see with exposure to these chemicals is, is liver tumors or cancers in fish. Um, Again, so you have you know relatively long-lived fish species. They develop cancer as well, and so we can look at these as a marker for adverse effects, um, particularly when they have like urban embayments or, or a chronic release source. Um, some of the other sublethal effects that we'd look at in fish are um, changes in re immune response. Um, we can see a, a decrease in, in um, their function and their ability to resist disease. Um, and this is an example of the liver, but there's enzymes in the liver that metabolize these chemicals. And so as they're exposed, they actually increase the amount of enzyme that's present. So we can look at the ab abundance of the enzyme and also the metabolites that are excreted. And in this case, the chemical actually, this is benzoapyrene, it's metabolized by the enzyme, and as part of the, the need to excrete it, actually makes it more water soluble and more toxic. So it's actually the presence of the um, metabolism that actually makes the chemical worse in the short term. Um, so when we look at pH metabolism in different components, 
um, or different species we can look at, not only how that influences those species, but also what we might want to monitor, depending on what input we're looking at. Um, so again, this is uh, benzoyl pyrene, and looking at what proportion of it is present over time, um, and how, how well it's able to metabolize it. So different invertebrates, we've got polychaetes, um, bivalves like mussels or clams, and then amphipods. So the more, the more that's metabolized, the more successful it is at excreting it. You can see that if you wanted to look at what organisms might have less present if you're going out and trying to monitor, um, there's a reason why we of, often select bivalves, because they're going to give us a more uh, long-term, stable measure of what, what the exposure is over time. But if we want to see like a localized source or what's been released shortly, you might look at something like an amphipod. And then for this is comparison for, for trout, it's actually a, a fairly short period, um, but invertebrates could be shorter or longer, and it's just really variable, so you need to know what you're looking at. Um, so when we're looking at bivalves in particular, again, that's, that's a marker that we often use for marine oil spills, if they're able, available in the environment that we're looking at. Um, so what do they do? Well, oftentimes they'll just close their shells. So that may prevent them from getting um, waterborne exposure. They may still have coating. But they can only stay closed so long without having impacts to those bivalves. They're used to being able to feed and um, excrete during that open period when the tide is high. So it's only a short-term help, but it has impacts to them as well. They can accumulate in their tissues. Again, they metabolize them fairly slowly, so we can actually look at them, collect them, have Jim analyze them for pHs, and look at those concentrations. Um, they've shown with increasing concentration that there's actually reduced growth in those organisms. We may not be going out in there and measuring it, but we can take the, the samples, get them analyzed, and then compare them to those benchmarks and say, do we expect that they have reduced growth given that exposure? Um, one of the other markers that we've been looking at is lysosomes are part of the cells that are involved, and when again, when these compounds get into the membranes, they're they don't stay intact, they actually leak out part of the cells, um, which is bad for them. And so this is one of these things, um, markers that we actually looked at with the Dubai Star Spill in San Francisco Bay. Um, this was actually with UC Davis. And so they looked at basically, this is again total um, pH concentration, This in this case in muscle tissue. Um, and then we looked at actually um, doing a bioassay where they looked at the number of intact lysosomes. And so basically, at, at sites where we had a low, lower pH concentration, we had a greater um, or a lower number of destabilized, a, a higher number of intact lysosomes, where when we got to a more contaminated site, we actually saw a change where there were um, more abundant um, or increased number of destabilized lysosomes. So a biomarker of what we can look at that has some link to adverse effects. Um, and then in terms of mortality, one of the things we can look at is is um, the number of abundance of gaping shells. So there's still tissue present. It's a recent impact, um, but they're no longer viable, and the shells are, in general, pop open. Um, so moving on to aquatic birds and mammals, um, we have the effects of direct oil contact in birds. Um, staff from uh, Oil Well Life Care Network are going to talk, I think, more extensively about this later this week, but I just want to broach the subject. Um, we can have direct oiling of, of fur uh, for mammals and feathers for birds, and that affects their ability to thermoregulate um, and changes their behavior. Um, so we not only have that on the individuals that are oiled, but oftentimes if the birds are nesting, the oil actually comes off in contact with the eggs, and so then the eggs are exposed through that external oiling. And that has been shown um, both in field and laboratory studies to impact the embryos. Um, not only through inhibiting gas exchange, but what does um, pass through the egg membranes actually has um, some toxicological effects as well. Um, there's the effects of the oil ingestion. So not only the physical coating, but then the birds preen or ingest the oil, and so that oil that is absorbed into their organism also has effects. And the way we looked at this um, is actually a way to, to calculate how they're exposed on a daily basis. Um, it's basically just saying how much how much of a prey do you eat? What's the concentration in that organism? Um, there's often incidental sediment ingestion, 
um, as they're eating or if they're like a waterfowl that tries to eat grit, um, what's the ingestion rate of sediment, what's the concentration in sediment, and divide it by your body weight. So, um, and then it's in milligrams of, of a given chemical per kilogram body weight per day. So that just gives us a way to compare across different studies that might have looked at a given chemical or mixture um, and to, to make that conversion. Um, and again, then we'll compare to those benchmarks. Um, in this case, again, it's no effect, low effect, or, or a lethal effect. Um, but because it's actually in, a, in, a, in an ingested dose, it's a level, not a media concentration, like a water concentration or a sediment concentration. And again, because studies may be on a crude oil or a particular pH, you really need to match what your benchmark is that you're comparing to, to what's specific um, to a given spill. And this calculation, again, doesn't, doesn't account for what might be taken up when they're drinking the water, um, if they're inhaling uh, volatile organics from what's coming off the oil on the feathers or what's directly contacted that needs to be accounted for separately. Um, so one of the ways that we can look at this, um, basically comparing on the left side what a predicted exposure was. This is from Prince William Sound. They took a look at, again, what portion of, of the diet they get from, from mussels and tried to look at the concentration in mussels and predicted what the exposure would be for two bird species and an otter. And so they looked at what that predicted dose would be, again, a similar concentration of, in this case, it is milligram per kilogram per day if you take out the times 1,000, and then comparing it to some of the, the no observed effect at level concentrations. Um, and some of that data is, is shown on the right where they fed mallard ducks different um, components of oil. I think some were Louisiana crude versus Alaska North Slope and, and figured out where you see some of these endpoints occurring. And so overall they determined that because the exposures were predicted to be less than the no effect threshold that they didn't expect to see an adverse effect from that particular um, so that's kind of how we often do it in terms of doing a, a risk assessment or a general threshold um, based on an ingested concentration. You know, what do we predict the exposure to be or what can we measure and then how do we compare it to benchmarks from other studies um, to look at that. Um, some of the more chronic effects of both total petroleum hydrocarbon in general or a specific pH uh, we can look at. Um, again, reproduction in birds can be adversely affected in terms of eggshell strength, the ability to produce eggs, the ability to have liable embryo in terms of hatchability or fertility. And again, we can look at these um, benchmarks of, of low observed effect level in about the several hundred to several thousands milligram per kilogram per day. And again, in a given study, look at the exposure compared to those benchmarks and say, do we think it's, it's plausible that we're having an effect on these embryos? Um, with growth, kind of consistent theme, you can have reduced growth with exposure to these chemicals. Um, and also liver and kidney, you can have adverse effects. Um, liver, again, not only the P450, the enzyme induction that you might look at the liver, but also because you're inducing all those endpoint enzymes, you can also have um, basically abnormally large livers. And then the kidney, you can see degeneration of the tissue, and both those are vital organs to the survivorship of, of these species. Um, and again, another consistent theme is, is decrease in immune response. So basically, that impacts the ability of these organisms to survive the normal disease um, that they have to deal with. Um, moving on to terrestrial ecosystems, um, we do deal with that um, under a different framework of our inland pollution um, focus. Um, and so we can look at, again, these components as a total petroleum hydrocarbon or the pH or a particular constituent. So starting out with um, total petroleum hydrocarbon. Um, there's a wide range of regulatory guidance. Sometimes, like for example, the Water Board will have one or a DTSC for a general framework. Um, but it's really wide range. Again, it's in 100 to, in this case, to tens of thousands of milligrams um, for a soil concentration. Um, in general, lighter mixtures like a gasoline or diesel, um, more toxic to heavier crude, 
But again, you want to match what, what your spill is to what benchmarks you're comparing. If you're comparing a crude oil concentration for a spill to a diesel benchmark, it's not appropriate, even if they're in the same units of a total petroleum hydrocarbon. Um, with plant species, we can, look, again, look at growth of germination. This is an example of, of doing a, a bioassay with lettuce. Um, so basically, they take a certain concentration of a chemical, mix it into soil, and then dilute out that soil. So you start out with a control with no, no contaminated soil, and you increase the amount of, or the proportion of contaminated soil, until which point you start seeing effects on the growth and germination of the lettuce. And so you can basically look, again, do that type of curve where we look at a dose response um, with that proportion. Um, and so you get certain benchmarks that, again, are in the, in the same type of range, where you hundreds to several thousands, um, in this case, in total petroleum hydrocarbons for crude oil. So with soil invertebrates, um, again, survival and reproduction, pretty consistent themes with what type of endpoints we would be looking at. Um, and pretty similar ranges, a little more sensitive in terms of, of what, where we'd see impacts to soil invertebrates with exposure to crude oil. Um, and then if we look at particular pHs that would be present in crude oil, we can do specific studies that look at those with individual exposures and get similar numbers and be able to compare between those. So, for example, with a fluoranthine, a P particular pH, we can look at impacts on, on plant growth and, and invertebrate reproduction. Um, EC20 is an effective concentration to 20% of the population for that particular endpoint of plant growth. Um, the invertebrate reproduction, it's a little bit, it's a lower percent of responsiveness. Um, but you can see how it changes between a given chemical um, and then the two populations, the plants versus the soil invertebrates. So if we go out to a site and measure a, a given concentration of phenanthrene in the soil, we can do this comparison. Do we think there would be effects on plants? Do we think there will be effects on soil invertebrates and, and at what level? Um, one of the other things we've talked about, how BTEX um, can be problematic when inhaled, like for example with birds off their feathers. But um, oftentimes in a terrestrial system we think, well, there's, there's, they're exposed to the open air, it'll dilute. But we do have the problem when we talk about exposure in burrows. And certainly, um, like for example with um, crude oil spills out in the desert, a lot of those organisms need to use burrows during the day, and so we need to consider what's the exposure if we do get these chemicals within their burrows. So um, we can have volatiles, again, if it's contaminated subsurface soil, if it's a leak from a tank, underground storage tank, or if there's um, contaminated groundwater, we have those volatiles coming up. Um, we can get um, those volatiles, the BTEX, into the soil gas that's in that area. Um, we can measure that. And then we need to consider what the exposure is to those burrowing animals through inhalation when they're in the, in the burrows, particularly during the day. And in some cases, it can be pretty long periods, particularly in the summer. Um, and again, we, they've done studies on what's the impact to exposure, um, particularly in this case with benzene. And, and similar to humans, you have impacts on bone marrow um, and can have anemia. And then you could calculate for a given exposure, would you expect to see that effect? And in this case, the benchmark is in a, in a soil um, air concentration. So I'm screaming through. So um, overall, you have a, a wide range of chemicals and a wide range of toxicity. And so you need to make sure um, that you're being um, comprehensive of what you're looking at and also specific to a given um, spill type. Um, it's complex. Just like trying to analyze the chemical mixture is difficult, then you need to evaluate for that overall mixture or particular constituents what the toxicity is. Um, you need to find that exposure effects relationship so that you know if you have a given concentration that you're measuring what you expect the effects might be <coughs> in terms of direct effects. And then what the short-term effects might be as well as the chronic or more long-time impacts and how we look at that. So 
Fast and Furious questions.